historical specialist here at the Montana Historical Society and delighted to welcome you to our program, What Can We Learn from World War I? And I'm here with my co-conspirator uh, and colleague, uh, Rich Arstad, a senior archivist here. And we are um, uh, gonna start, I guess. I'm just gonna turn it over to Rich to set the stage and give us a little context. I'm, I'm just the hired hand, so just so you know, this was all Martha's idea. She <laughs> He drug no me, she drug me into it because if the presentation goes south, I'm a bigger target for the rotten fruit. Just so you know. But I do have my leather jacket on, so you know, please aim for the chin and up. Um, this is a very timely moment uh, for this presentation, as today marks the centennial of Congress's declaration of war against Germany and its companion states uh, in France in 1917. And so that was one of the reasons that we wanted to, to kick this off today, um, to mark that seminal event. Uh, and World War I is an event that essentially shaped the 20th century. And if you look at what's going on in the rest of Europe and the Middle East, especially the Middle East, it's defining 21st century that we're all familiar with as well. And so the reverberations of this war have not faded, and who knows if they, if they ever will. Um, so on April 6, 1917, uh, President Woodrow Wilson went before Congress and asked for a declaration of war against Germany. And the United States found itself for the first time in a global war. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, what about the Spanish-American War? Well, that was very localized, and it was over really before it actually got started, except in the Philippines, where we ended up fighting those individuals that we went to free. And uh, the Civil War was insular. It was a civil war, of course. So trying to mobilize a nation that had spent since 1914 doing its best to make itself neutral was a Herculean task uh, for President Wilson and Congress to undertake. Uh, there were a number of things that they needed to do. They needed troops, um, so that meant a draft. Uh, they needed money to pay for the war. Uh, there wasn't enough money in the Bank of Kyle, of course, to pay for everything that they were going to need to purchase in terms of war supplies and paying soldiers and those types of things. So they were going to have to they were going to have to collect money from the citizens of the United States. They needed food, not only to feed their army, or the U.S. Army, but also to feed our allies overseas as well, who had been fighting in this war for the last three years. <coughs> Excuse me. And material, and material is one of the things that has one of the larger impacts on Montana, besides the, the number of troops, because Montana, of course, had copper, and so the copper mines were going to be running full tilt coal was needed for the operation of trains and steamships and so forth, and lumber. Lumber was considered a wartime essential material as well, and so that was also going to be necessary. And how to get those wartime materials from the United States to France, um, considering, you know, you have to take into account the U-boat campaign that the Germans had in the Atlantic and the fact that they had almost completely shut down transcontinent, or transatlantic uh, shipping uh, already. So it was going to be a, it was going to be a pretty huge task uh, for them to undertake. And during that process, there wasn't going to be time to be polite in some instances about things uh, because they were going to have to move fast and they were going to have to make quick decisions and some of those decisions were going to hurt um, everyday average citizens. Um, one of my favorite historians talks about this war. The other thing in terms of the national context of the war is um, that it, it comes right in the middle of the progressive era. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the debates that are going on at the time about uh, Americanization, about uh, industrialization, about urbanization and all its intended ills. Um, and David Kennedy said, America went to war in 1917, not only against Germans in the fields of France, but against each other at home. And I think you'll see that as we go through. 
part of the Montana context, of course, is um, immigration, well, part of the American context, but also the Montana context is immigration. And hopefully this will go straight to the, this is the story map, and you all got a bookmark that takes, that'll show you where to go to the website uh, to find um, this map that we created for this project. Um, and it's coming. Uh, one of the things that we did for this map, though, is we uh, not only corrected specific stories, but we also collected uh, demographic data. And in 1910, um, Montana was 66% um, immigrant or children of immigrants. So e someone either had an immigrant parent or was an immigrant themselves. And you can look here and we can pull up. So for example, you know, in Butte, obviously in Silver Bow, it's much bigger. 74% uh, are foreign born or the, have a foreign born parent. Um, but really everywhere, you know, you take Valley County and 61% uh, foreign born or with a foreign born parent. Um, and that's, it's a young state, you know, and of course some of them were from Canada and some of them were from England, but a lot more of them were from Ireland or um, Finland or uh, German or Russian, Russia, but Russians of German descent. Um, and they came here to mine copper, they came here to mine coal, they came here to log, and they came here to homestead. And of course, some of these people are um, not on the Allies' side in their home countries. So, the other part of In context to what Martha was saying about uh, David Kennedy's quote about the fact that America went to war in France and went to war at home, it actually had started fairly early in Montana with organized labor going up against the industrial might of Montana, essentially. Since the early 1890s, um, organized labor in terms of the Western Federation of Miners, uh, the uh, American Railway Union, uh, the United Mine Workers, and so forth, had been battling these huge corporate conglomerates in, in Montana, like the Anaconda Company and so forth, <coughs> um, working on safer working conditions, um, higher wages, shorter work days, and those types of things. And as a result of that, um, these conflicts actually broke into open warfare themselves on a number of occasions. And the governor of the state of Montana on a number of occasions was required to call out the National Guard and attempt to quell um, the labor unrest that was going on across the state. And it wasn't just localized uh, in Butte. Um, you'll notice that there's a couple of images here um, that relate to the timber industry, especially in western Montana, where the industrial workers of the world, the, the infamous villainous IWW, um, had a pretty good toehold established as early as 1907 uh, in the logging camps and so forth. And um, of course, the, the IWW believed in the overthrow of the capitalist system, and everything was for the benefit of the workers and so forth. And so that created quite a controversy within the boundaries of Montana as they battled uh, this, this radical union. Um, and I, I, there's no doubt that the IWW was the big boogeyman of World War I, not just in Montana, but in other states as well. But for Montana, it was, it was extremely, um, their presence was extremely, it was feared on an extreme level. Um, you'll see the newspaper clipping from the popular standard, or popular star, I can't remember which, um, over on your left. And it actually refers to an event that took place shortly after the Butte Miners Union members blew up their own mining hall in 1914. Some harvest wobblies in the Dakotas stole a great northern train and headed west towards Butte where they had hoped to assist their brother miners and so forth in their uprising against the company. And they got as far as Chelsea, Montana before uh, they got stopped. Uh, there was about 100 wobblies on the train. There were about 300 people on the train total. But it created quite a stir across the state as they talked about this invasion of the IWW of the state of Montana. And of course the numbers got inflated every time it was reported in the newspaper so that by the time it was finally broke up, um, they were talking about an army of 1,500 
uh, men descending on Butte to uh, overthrow the Anaconda Company. All right, so that's the context. You, you have Germans, you have Irish, who, uh, whose home country is at war now, you have Irish who don't want to fight the British, you have labor radicals, and, and now you have the draft. I like how quickly you just turned that over. I, I just realized how much of this actually has my name on it. I mean, wow, okay. So you're gonna have to put up with, my, with, with, with me. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we did that I found extremely interesting in this project, besides the, the entire thing, um, it was a fabulous project that Martha came up with, but was researching the stories of some of these soldiers. Obviously, we couldn't research the stories of all of Montana's servicemen and, World War, servicemen and women in World War I, but we could do a few to kind of give you a cross-section of what they experienced uh, during the war. So this first slide um, here uh, presents two of those uh, more senior members of the military from Montana. Again, on your left is the... Um, identity card for Captain George Slack. He was a lumberman out of Northwest Montana up in Kalispell. And they recruited him specifically and promoted him to uh, as an officer because of his ability and knowledge on how to operate a sawmill. And so one of the first things the American Expeditionary Force did or called for once they got to France was that they needed a regiment that would come to France for the sole purpose of cutting lumber for the war effort. And so because of Captain Slack's um, knowledge of, of, of that and running a sawmill and so forth and dealing with what was called small wood, um, uh, he was tapped to serve in the 20th Engineers and he shipped overseas and was there until 1919 uh, working uh, with the 20th Engineers and then later with the railroads helping rebuild France after the war. The other gentleman is Horace Bivens. Horace Bivens had a distinguished career in the 10th Cavalry, the Buffalo Soldiers, serving in the Southwest and Montana in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, he saw action in Cuba. Uh, the Buffalo Soldiers, the 10th, was one of the units that, well, saved Teddy Roosevelt's butt when he charged up Kettle Hill. Um, and uh, so he'd already served his country and had retired from service when the war broke out and he ended up selling his irrigated farm um, on the Yellowstone for a loss and re-enlisted, um, was made a captain and served uh, in a supply unit overseas. I just skipped a whole bunch so you know. Good. Uh, and we don't have a picture of this next individual, but uh, Vincent Albert Nolan was from Livingston, Montana. And he was an interesting young man. He joined the Navy and got sent to France. Um, this is what happens when they make you a pharmacist mate. Uh, so essentially he became a medic. And for some reason, the Navy doesn't trust the Marine Corps to supply their own medics. And so uh, Navy pharmacist mates become medics for the Marine Corps. As such, um, he saw action in Bella Wood and I'm going to slaughter these French names. You know that, right? This Norwegian tongue just can't do them. Um, the Moose Argonne Offensive and so forth, uh, where he was awarded the French... Croix de Guerre. Croix de Guerre. As well as the uh, Distinguished um, Service Cross uh, that he received from General Pershing for his, uh, for his actions during October 1 through October 10 in 1918. The young man on your right is Elmer Cowan, and he's from Victor, Montana. Uh, as you can see from his medals and so forth, he was quite the high school athlete. Like George Slack, uh, he was enlisted into the 20th Engineers and uh, trained and uh, shipped overseas. He was aboard the SS Tuscania off the coast of Ireland in February of 1918 uh, when it was torpedoed and sunk by a German U-boat. Um, there were 210 casualties uh, with the sinking of the Tuscania, and among those 210, seven Montana men lost their lives. Elmer Cowan was one of them. Um, this is a pretty horrific story that received quite a bit of media attention in Montana. 
especially in the Missoulian and, and, and other newspapers along the western part of the, the part of the state. The interesting thing about this is that uh, Governor Stewart received word of the sinking of the Tuscania and the death of these seven Montana men just before he gave his speech before the legislature asking for a sedition bill for Montana. I got another half a page. We, we, we didn't rehearse, so you'll have to forgive us for that, too. Martha said she was good to go. I have four minutes. I have ten on this one, don't I? Stop arguing. Okay. So um, one of the people, one of the special people that actually Martha did research on that, that we both found absolutely fantastic, or, uh, uh, fascinating was surgical nurse uh, Violet Hodgson, Hodgson who uh, was one among one of the first Montana women and one of the few married Montana women uh, to serve in France. Uh, she was recruited through the Red Cross and she worked as, a chief, as the chief nurse for Major V.P. Blair who specialized in facial reconstruction. Um, later she was assigned to a mobile hospital corps, MASH, um, as she uh, followed the advancing troops along the Moose Argonne Offensive and worked very closely to the front stabilizing wounded soldiers and so forth to be sent back. Um, to the uh, to the rear. The gentleman on the right is George Whitcomb. He was 16 years old when he enlisted in the uh, Montana Guard, and uh, he was just a he was just a teenager. And uh, he was part of a machine gun unit, and he also received the uh, Distinguished Service Cross from General Pershing. He has a slightly interesting story about that. He told his parents that he was worried that he would get a swelled head about receiving the medal from General Pershing. But in fact, because he had to walk 16 miles to the medal ceremony and then 16 miles back to the barracks, it wasn't his head that swelled, it was his feet. <laughs> um, he would later die very tragically here in Helena, Montana, 20 years later as a result of a very weird uh, incident. And I'm not going to tell you any more than that because you can go upstairs to the research center and you can find out for yourself. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> All right. So every one of those soldiers that's serving overseas left neighbors, friends, uh, wives, mothers, um, sisters uh, at, at home. And uh, Montana, you know, set, had 17% of uh, the eligible, the men who are eligible to serve, served in Montana. It's a really high uh, number. Um, some say it's the highest in the U.S., others say top three, but it's, uh, there were a lot of Montana men uh, per capita uh, who <coughs> were serving in the military. And um, as you can imagine, there was a lot of desire to support those men, and there was also a tremendous uh, push. You know, again, when we were talking about uh, not everyone agreed with the war necessarily to begin with, not everyone agreed with the side that we took in the war to begin with, there's a huge national campaign to uh, drum up patriotic fervor. Um, so it's both a natural... Uh, heartfelt desire to support the troops serving overseas, and it's also something that propaganda is really boosting up. Um, uh, one way that, and, and, and a lot of this work ends up being done at home by women. Uh, not all of it, but they're the ones that are left at home, right? So one of the organizations that a lot of uh, people, especially women, work through was the Red Cross. It became the prime organization for mobilizing women for war work. Thousands of women across Montana and 8 million women nationwide joined the Red Cross. Um, and I saw a 1921 newspaper report that Montana had 24,646 Red Cross members. And they held all sorts of fundraisers. Um, so that this quilt here was made by the Cascade County Ladies Auxiliary to the Order of the United Commercial Travelers. Uh, they sewed the quilt. Um, for a small fee, they would embroider your name on the quilt, and then they raffled the quilt in April 1918, raising a total of uh, $1,060.80 for the Red Cross. Uh, Red Cross also created lots and lots of women to create relief items. With the help of the Junior Red Cross, uh, nationally the Red Cross produced 317 
at 72 million relief articles during the war. And here we have Maria Drennan of Miles City, and she wrote uh, on the back of this picture that she spent 1,600 hours knitting socks, 61 pairs of men's socks and 41 pairs of children's socks because the relief work is for the soldiers, but it's also to help the civilians of war-torn Europe. Uh, there's a lot of patriotism involved in this effort, um, but there's also a lot of peer pressure. Um, the Roundup record uh, and on its editorial page wrote that the woman who neglects her duties to the soldiers for the sake of card parties and other unnecessary social functions is a slacker. <laughs> Just as a man who wouldn't serve would be a slacker. Uh, another big responsibility back home was feeding our troops. Um, to, uh, to feed the army and the allies, the US government asked citizens to mobilize the spirit of self-denial and self-sacrifice. Of course, farmers worked to increase agricultural output, um, and uh, that involved, in some cases, taking out loans, loans that maybe they weren't necessarily eligible for, but banks would give them be out of patriotism. Uh, and you can imagine, during the drought that followed World War I and the crash in commodity prices, uh, led to a lot of bankrupt farmers and then bankrupt banks and really started Montana on the road to the Great Depression uh, a decade before the rest of the country. But not just, not just kind of that mass production that, uh, of agricultural production, but also um, w uh, uh, what they called war gardens, right? Every kid, every household was supposed to supplement with, um, with, a, with a war garden. Uh, wheatless Wednesdays and meatless Mondays. Uh, so there's a Red Cross cookbook over here, uh, which you can find online. Um, and that served a dual purpose. It was a fundraiser for the Red Cross. It was created by the Sanders County Red Cross women. Uh, but it also offered recipes like conservation soup and general Pershing salad. So to encourage the use of leftovers and alternative grains and proteins. And again, not everyone was um, too gung-ho. There was no formal rationing in the US during the war. Uh, but you did, if you were going to buy white flour, you had to buy a certain amount of alternative grain as well, like rye flour. Um, and Dan Cushman, who wrote a wonderful reminiscence about growing up in Montana um, out by Har uh, Harlem, he wrote that his mom made what they called war bread, and that was with rye, rye grains and these other grains. And it was so disgusting that none of them could eat it. She fed it to the chickens, and after that, they did their patriotic duty by eating their war bread in the form of ch fried chicken and scrambled eggs. <laughs> so. Um, so food, uh, items, but also money. Um, in addition to contributing to voluntary organizations like the Red Cross, Americans were expected to contribute directly to the war effort through the purchase of Liberty Bonds. The sale of Liberty Bonds nationwide raised $17 billion to help pay for the war. And again, um, you know, this was partly set up as a way to fund it without raising taxes, uh, but it was also a way to get American buy-in, literally, into the war. And you can see that one poster. It lists all sorts of names, right? O'Brien, Sekka, you know. Uh, so there are all sorts of different uh, nationalities listed on that poster. They're all coming together to buy war bonds. Um, but it's not just patriotism. Again, there's also coercion involved. In Columbia Falls in April 1918, a soliciting committee went house to house, uh, armed with the detailed final financial information. They had a little card. And for each family, on the card, it wrote how much they should expect as a contribution. Uh, and it also had information about what they were estimated, what their estimated net worth was, what their estimated income was, what their estimated debt was, how much they had contributed to previous bond issues, how much they had contributed to the Red Cross. This is all before NAFTA, NSA. And so these, and they would come and they would knock on your door, right? And they, but they wouldn't tell you, and this is all in the newspaper is reporting that we're gonna send people to the door to door, they're gonna have this information, we've decided how much we think you should contribute, um, but we're not gonna tell you. Um, you give what you think is right, However, if you subscribe less than was estimated to be your share, 
that matter will be taken up in a different way. <laughs> so um, we're going to try something a little different. We're going to pause for a minute now, and we're going to do this, I think, uh, four times total throughout the program um, to try to encourage a little conversation. Uh, and both Rich and I, one of the things that we see um, when we look at World War I are a lot of parallels, a lot of things that, that and, and not parallels with today. And in this case, uh, maybe a little less of a parallel. There's a tremendous effort to commitment everywhere to support the troops, right, during World War I. It was expected, it was coerced, it was desired, and it was on every street corner. Um, we've been at war for a lot of years now, and I'm going to bet that um, I'm not the only one who sometimes forgets that fact in this room, right? So that's a way that World War I is really different than uh, the war that we have today. So what we're going to ask, we're going to set up this little experiment. Um, I'm going to ring this little bell. I got a little bell. All right. Uh, to, to start you, but I'm going to give instructions first. I'm going to have you turn to a neighbor, um, and if it can be someone who um, you didn't come with, all the better. Um, and just have one or two minutes of conversation about the question, and of course, um, civil dialogue. I don't think we talk enough to people maybe anymore who disagree with us or may not share our opinions, um, so we should, you know, seek first to understand, you know, you're not debating, you're clarifying, you're trying to gain clarity in your own mind about what you think, you're curious about what other people um, think, and um, we'll see if we can learn something from each other. So our first question um, to talk about is exactly this question, and we're going to ask you to first talk about it in the context of World War I, and then in the context of today. And that question is, how did we uh, support our troops serving overseas? Ah, we're missing one, in the context of World War I. And how should we be doing that today? So. Turn to your neighbor, and I'll ring the bell to stop us. So, start. so you know, I talked about that coercion, and I've, I've gestured, I uh, mentioned a little bit um, about uh, um, the fact that we are a multinational, multi-ethnic <coughs> state, um, and this push for 100% Americanism, as we saw that in that previous slide. Um, the propaganda used to mobilize support for the war on the home front had additional con uh, consequences. It not only um, created support for the war, but it quickly turned to suspicion and hatred for all things German. Um, so, for example, a game warden, um, Elmer King of, of Red Lodge, uh, talked about confronting his German neighbors. He said, yeah, the Waltermans were Germans, and I was booing about Germany. I says, damn, why the hell don't you go back there and stay? We don't need you here. That's what I told them right to their faces and made them like it. Um, and he reported that in an oral history uh, interview many years later. Uh, the government got involved, too. <laughs> Every state had a council of defense. There's a national council of defense. They deputized state councils. Uh, the original <laughs> brief was really to increase agricultural production and encourage draft registration. Uh, but in Montana, the council gained legal authority to pass orders relating to the war. Uh, and one of uh, order number three, so one of the early orders that they passed, listed 12 books that all schools and libraries needed to remove from circulation. Those books included German songs, the first German reader, and the history textbook, The Ancient World, which was considered too favorable in its, uh, the history and the way that it treated Germany. Uh, it also instructed authorities to remove any other book that could contain German propaganda. Uh, Melstone, Montana, in Muscle Shell County, and some other communities went further. Um, the Melstone school principal reported that all German texts and library books were burned on Liberty Loan Day. Uh, so they had a big bonfire. Uh, uh, Lewistown actually had a big bonfire and burned their German books before the order was passed. So they broke into the high school, they demanded uh, the books, and had a, a huge fire uh, and... Uh, um, uh, that was even prior to this, this order. Order number three also outlawed the use of the German language in the pulpits of the state. 
So uh, you can look in the Council of Defense records that we have upstairs in our archives, and you'll find lots of letters from ministers asking for exceptions. Uh, the minister, J.E. Schatz of Plevna, wrote to Governor Studert, we have many who are unable to understand English. If our preaching shall be in English, can not we hold our prayer meeting in German? And his answer was no. Uh, Lutheran pastor H.E. Vamhoff of Laurel wrote similarly. He said, especially the old people are not able to speak a word of English, and they understand very little. Of a sermon preached in English, the majority understand nothing but the words God, Jesus, and Amen. He asked the, he asked the council to allow us to have our communion service also the funeral services in German. And he explained, to partake of the Lord's Supper without understanding what is said would be sinful. Uh, he went on to point out that the Constitution guaranteed freedom of worship. Uh, and again, the answer was no. Um, and uh, there were other requests as well. And in every case, the answer was no. Um, in some case, the uh, anti-German sentiment led to mod, mob action. So as I mentioned, in Lewistown, the angry mob uh, not only grabbed the German textbooks, uh, but they also grabbed men they thought were pro-German and they made them kiss the flag. Uh, this big day of haranguing people and burning books ended in the evening when 2,000 people joined an evening parade. Hardest hit were German Mennonites who were both German and pacifists. Uh, John Franz, whose picture you see on the right as an older man, was the leader of a community of Mennonite farmers in eastern Montana. And uh, in 1918, <coughs> the county sheriff, two attorneys, a banker, and other prominent men kidnapped uh, Mr. Franz um, from a local school board meeting. Uh, these 12 men forced him into a car. His wife, his seven-month pregnant wife, tried to get in the car with him. Uh, they knocked her down. They drove away. They drove 30 miles to an isolated spot in the Badlands where there was one big tree. Uh, they tried to place a noose around his neck. Um, and uh, he was able to hold on to it long enough to convince them instead that they should really give him a hearing. Uh, so they brought him back to Glendive, where he spent two nights in jail, uh, and there was talk of taking him out of the jail and then lynching him uh, before the hearing, uh, but his wife had insisted in staying in, and, the, and children had insisted staying in jail with him, so that, that didn't happen. But 200 people came to his, what they called a guerrilla hearing. Uh, officials interrogated him. <coughs> before the uh, court released him on a $3,000 bond. And um, lots more details in this story. Um, uh, it wasn't just Germans, though. As I mentioned, Germans weren't the only ones uh, that weren't necessarily in favor of the war. Uh, also, the Irish nationalists really did not think very highly of siding with the English. And the Finns, the Finn, um, <coughs> Finland was occupied by Russia at the time. They didn't really like the idea of siding with the Russians. <coughs> Lots of Finns were socialists. They were worried uh, to, um, uh, they were, uh, and, and a lot of Finns involved in the industrial workers of the world, um, uh, which as Rich mentioned was a, a union that was quite anti-war. Um, and I wanna be clear, you know, with Mr. Franz, he was a pacifist. He, um, he didn't buy war bonds, but he and his community gave a higher percentage of their earnings to the Red Cross than anyone else in the neighborhood. So, um, you know, not necessarily an active <coughs> threat, uh, but in some case there really were. And <coughs> on draft registration day, so that uh, for World War I, there was one particular day that um, uh, all of the men who were 21 to 31 were required to register for the draft. Um, and on that day, the um, Finnish socialists and the Irish, oh, thank you. Other duties is assigned. <laughs> the Irish uh, nationalists joined together in a draft uh, protest. They ha had handbills that said things like, war is hell, we don't want it do not register, um, they handed those out. 
uh, I saw estimates of everything from, you know, f hundreds to thousands of men and women. It was led by a Finnish woman took, taking to the streets of Butte, trying to convince people not to register and to disrupt the draft. Um, and ultimately, the mayor did call out the National Guard, and he arrested 20 men and one woman. And in Red Lodge, um, the Liberty Committee targeted Finnish coal miners, <coughs> particularly men that they thought were IWW leaders. Uh, and they took, for example, John Moore Wintery into the basement of the Elks Lodge, and they strung a noose around his head, and they strung him up three times before he would give up the names of other members, other IWW members. Um, and this is an article about another man, Emil Kosky, who they take and they abuse, and then they let go. <laughs> he goes home, um, and the Liberty Committee comes back to it. Uh, his house, he, def he has his rifle, he defends himself, shots are fired on both sides, uh, and he ends up killing his boarder, uh, a woman that, that is living with him uh, uh, by accident in this uh, exchange. So, a lot going on that way. Which brings us to another question for you to turn and talk for two minutes to your neighbor about. And in this case, the question is, did foreign nationals living in the U.S. pose a threat to our security or way of life in, during World War I? Or do, and do foreign nationals living in the U.S. pose a threat to our security or way of life today? So, let's talk about it. And this time, I'd like to try something. I'm wondering if we can get one or two people to maybe summarize your discussion in um, under a minute. So I'm gonna time you, actually, and we're gonna cut you off ferociously. Yep, that'll be Rich's job. He's my, you know, he has the garrote. Uh, if you go over a minute, but uh, can I get someone to, with that like really like welcoming introduction. Does anyone want to share what a little bit of their conversation? If you don't raise your, your hand, she'll pick somebody. No, I would never. Can I get it? Would anyone be willing? You want it short? Yeah. The first one is no, the second one is yes. The first one is no, and the second one is yes. Okay, give us another 30 seconds. 30 seconds. No! Montana is um, sheltered, or at least I feel sheltered, and that um, in today's turmoil, um, it's, it's horrendous to hear it and to see it as we are as evolving in, in uh, the world affairs, but I still think we are sheltered in Montana. Uh, and in World War I, Again, the people that came here were farmers or uh, people of the land, Germans or Irish or Russians or whatever they were, and I don't think they ever had an intent to um, do anything bad. That's just my thoughts. <laughs> no, I appreciate your willingness to say something. All right, one more. I'd have to say the answers are no and no. Uh, you know, the people, foreign nationals that are coming here are coming here for the same reason that foreign nationals came here 100 years ago. They're seeking a safe and place where they can build a life for them and their families. All of the terrorism incidents in the United States that are blamed on terrorists have been by people who were born and raised here, not by immigrants. Well, thank you. There you go. So that you know that this was a conversation that they had a hundred years ago um, on the national level and the state level as well. Uh, one of the things that they discussed um, that the war gave them the opportunity is to eliminate the hyphenated American. So you weren't going to be an Irish American anymore. You weren't going to be an Italian American anymore. You weren't going to be a German American anymore. You were just going to be an American. And so there, were, there was a group out there that saw this as an opportunity to 
America, Americanized America. And they did this through various forms of, of, uh, of, as Martha talked about, the propaganda and the liberty loans and things like that. But they also realized how much they depended on the foreign immigrant worker to the point that the National Council of Defense issued a proclamation to the State Councils of Defense in 1918 suggesting to them how to celebrate Labor Day and impress upon the immigrant workers who were at home working on behalf of the war effort and supporting the soldiers overseas on how that was benefiting the nation as a whole and bringing them essentially into the fold of being come, becoming Americans and simply Americans. So there was a lot going on uh, with, the, uh, with the process. And there was a lot of pushback from various groups as well. Um, one of the uh, more interesting ones uh, was very much like the IWW. It was called the Nonpartisan League. Uh, it was essentially the agrarian version of the industrial workers of the world. Um, they had a fairly strong presence in the Dakotas and in eastern Montana. And uh, in 1918 was kind of a watershed year for the Nonpartisan League in Montana. Um, first and foremost, they sent Charles Taylor, Red Flag Charlie, uh, to Sheridan County in 1918 to become the editor of the Nonpartisan League's newspaper, uh, the Producers News. Um, as I said, it was a left-leaning organization, uh, a lot like the IWW. Under Taylor, the Producers News became the leading socialist slash communist newspaper in the state. And uh, Taylor essentially beat the drum for communism at the end of the war, much to the delight of the Danish and Norwegian farmers who lived in that area, who supported um, the Producers News. And as you can imagine, Sheridan County is not a heavily pop wasn't a heavy, heavily populated county back then. It's not a heavily populated uh, county now. Uh, Plentywood was the largest community. It wasn't excessively large. The Producers News and the Nonpartisan League had support from the rural farmers, not the community of Plentywood itself. So that kind of created an interesting dynamic um, for the county and for the residents of that county as they tried to come to terms with this, this split in ideology that was, that was dividing them. And, in this, and, and essentially led to the division of the county itself and the creation of Daniels County after the war. Um, in 1918 as well, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, former President Theodore Roosevelt, came to Billings uh, essentially to support the Fourth Liberty Loan Drive. However, he focused primarily on the dangers of the Nonpartisan League. Um, and the fact that it was supporting the election of Jeanette Rankin's, uh, the election of jo Jeanette Rankin for her bid for a Senate seat um, on a third party ticket. The NPL, Roosevelt believed, secretly opposed the war and promoted state ownership of banks and grain elevators. To Roosevelt, this smacked of Bolshevism and communism, and it was, it was, very, it was considered very anti American. Uh, Roosevelt, of course, was a pretty big uh, personality at that time frame, and his stump speech, in an essence, helped lead to the demise of the Nonpartisan League. What are you doing? To let's talk That's about it. it. Oh my goodness! Yeah. All right. I'm on time. I told you. Yeah. Wow, that was fast. I'd get you there. So, um, in terms of the mm -hmm. Nonpartisan League and what you, I just want to point out, I'm going to go back because I don't know if everyone in the back can see that, but it's a great cartoon. It happens right at the end of the war. It's published in the Nonpartisan League newspaper and it says facing a new job and it's a soldier, a GI, uh, and he says, now to get back home and help dad and the boys clean up a few aristocrats there, right? Autocrats. autocrats, sorry, autocrats to the USA. Right, so that's that's one vision of Americanism. Um, it's not the one that wins out uh, after the war. So, with that context, let's talk a little bit about what does it mean to be a good American. Once again, we're looking for some volunteers, a couple of volunteers who would like to share um, what they discussed with their conversation mate. I don't know if it's fair that you leave the room. 
Um, it seems like that in the context of World War I, that being a good American was very literal. It was buying liberty bonds, decided for you whether you are good or bad. And today, there's still some of that, but it seems like it's much more that if you're a good person, you are a good American. If you uphold the ideals of the Constitution, and it doesn't necessarily need to be displayed constantly or very obvious, but um, if you know your neighbor is a good person, you don't need to know whether they're donating to the local community shelter or something like that. You just trust that they are upholding their um, end of the deal, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's go. You, you gonna let him off the hook? I am. Okay. Um, just real quickly, Uncle Sam is cleaning house, you can see here. This isn't a great slide, but he's got a trader here, he's got a slacker, uh, he's got a member of the IWW, and he's got a member of the uh, Nonpartisan League there. So he's essentially cleaning house of all the malcontents, or who he perceives as the malcontents. Yeah, that, that worked. Could you give us a little better explanation of what the Nonpartisan League was? The Nonpartisan League was an agricultural movement. Uh, the farmers, not only in the Dakotas and eastern Montana, but also down through the, the big section of the, the Great Plains and so forth, believed that the railroads and the grain elevator operators and so forth had, and, and the banks had an unfair advantage over them. Um, so essentially they could squeeze them for every dime that they could and they were making huge profits off of the uh, off of the crops that these farmers were raising. So what they did was that they came together almost like a, a labor union to combat this together um, because there's strength in numbers. Uh, let's, let's face facts. Uh, if the larger voice you have, the more likely you are to be heard. And so they came together and they joined the nonpartisan league. They were neither Republican nor Democrat. They were just farmers and they wanted a fair shake with what, um, what they were doing for a living and, and, and the commodity that they were marketing. And they felt that they should receive the same thing. So as part of that, they believed, as I mentioned earlier, that the federal government should nationalize the grain elevators and the banks and so forth so they couldn't gouge them um, for uh, extra money. The interesting thing about that is and Martha, you chip in here if I get this wrong. Um, the councils of defense actually encouraged the farmers, um, and I'm gonna use Montana as an example, obviously, to actually overextend themselves in purchasing farm equipment and so forth so that they could increase their yield. And they did this without any regard whatsoever what was going to happen when the war was over, and there was no longer this huge demand for, for wheat and so forth. And so that was one of the, if you, if you go to the story map, that's one of the aftermath stories um, that we talk about there is what happens when that economy collapses at the end of World War I. And so that's kind of what the Nonpartisan League was attempting to do was, was to, control, con to control the prices and so forth and, and, and even the playing field between themselves and, and, and uh, the big corporations. Did I do okay? You did great. Okay. <laughs> it's, always, it's always good to check. Um, so, the price of freedom. We talked about that uh, just a little bit. Um, one of the things that became a handicap to freedom and what we would see is probably an overreach of First Amendment rights and so forth was the, uh, the passage of the Sedition Act. Um, Montana Senator uh, Henry Myers of Hamilton introduced a National Sedition Act in 1917 um, that would punish folks for inflammatory talk. And it was targeted um, almost directly at the industrial workers of the world. Uh, the industrial workers of the world were great about, well, to use, to use modern terms, they were good at talking smack. And so that's what they did, and so Myers believed that that anybody openly preaching strikes or denouncing the war or the United States government or so forth should be charged with sedition. Um, the bill was killed in committee, um, but by 1918, attitudes had changed. 
here at home in Montana, as well as on the national scene. And as I mentioned earlier, in February of 1918, Montana experienced its first war casualties. And this was just before Governor Stewart went before the legislature um, during a special session to enact a sedition law for Montana. And in that speech, he referenced the fact that he could not, he could not in good conscience not act on what he saw as disloyalty here at home when the sons of Montana's mothers were getting killed in the war. And some claim that that was a huge swing point for his, his speech and his, his, his ask for a sedition act, which the Montana legislature quickly passed um, that same month in 1918. And then, interesting enough, uh, Senator Myers went back to uh, the U.S. Congress and introduced a bill that was almost word for word of Montana Sedition Act, and it passed on the national level. And essentially, if you were caught saying anything inflammatory about the President of the United States, uh, anything inflammatory about soldiers serving in the military, anything that could be conceived as pro-German, and so forth, you could be charged with sedition and tried for treason. And there were several instances of that in Montana, and several individuals actually served prison terms for, for sedition at the time. Um, the other aspect of that was the heavy-handedness of the Council of Defense. Martha mentioned um, Order Number 5. Uh, the first order itself is pretty interesting because, um, as they said, to prevent as far as possible riots, affrays, and other forms of violence, they ordered that no parade, procession, or other public demonstration, funerals accepted, um, be held without written permission of the governor. And so typically they would write and ask for permission of the governor, and he would typically say no. Um, the order was targeted towards the socialist and unionist and the anti-Irish, uh, or the anti-British, Irish, and so forth, who would congregate in these big demonstrations and so forth um, in an attempt to sway public opinion in their, on their behalf. Um, so that was going to essentially lock that down. It was very similar to what was occurring in 1909 um, with the free speech fights in the West uh, that happened in Missoula and in Spokane and then in Seattle, where the IWW essentially took up residence on a street corner and would do things like read the Constitution to a crowd of fellow workers and so forth until the local authorities came and arrested them. And they kept doing that until they overflowed the city jail system and so forth and essentially broke the city ordinance that didn't allow for them to congregate on the street corners to spread their message. Um, so everything from the Wilsall uh, 4th of July procession of Boy Scouts and Campfire Girls to Hardin's Red Cross Carnival required a special permit from the governor in order for them to hold those, those events. Another aspect of this overreach into freedom of speech was the American Protective League. Um, the American Protective League was a national organization of volunteer spies. And essentially they would go out and they would spy on their friends and their families and their neighbors and to check and see how loyal uh, they were. Um, so an example of that was uh, C.H. Dodd, who was from the Freud area, and he noticed that his German neighbors were gathering at the Freud butcher shop. And so he thought that that was suspicious, so he reported it to the Council of Defense. And um, the Council of Defense decided that it was an informal gathering, so it remained legal, but he al they also cautioned Dodge to keep track of the situation in case it did turn out to be a German, a German cell. So you can see that there was a fairly significant overreach on the part of the federal government as well as the state into what we hold as one of our most dear rights, the freedom of speech, to criticize or praise our government, our president, our, our, our Congress, our legislature, whatever. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was quite a big step. It essentially um, 
reverberated through the rest of the, the teens and into the 20s with the, with the Red Scare, the spread of communism, uh, the Palmer raids back east to break up uh, communist cells and communist uh, union organizations and those types of things as well. And I think we're running out of time, so I think um, Quick we're. Question, though. What, what's the convict? Oh, like this? well, that's one of the men who was arrested uh, uh, for sedition. He was a German uh, farmer in northeastern Montana, and when he went to register for the draft, as he was required to do by law, he said he thought that the war was a crock and we shouldn't. The people didn't want it. And they arrested him, and after a one-day trial, uh, they convicted him, and he uh, was served 25 months in uh, Deer Lodge, leaving his wife and nine children. Um, and he was not alone. And I'll just say, you know, when, from our perspective, it looks like this, like, it seems crazy, but from the perspective of the time, you know, you do have these draft rioters. You do have these wild-eyed IWWs hijacking trains. You have the Russian Revolution going on. Um, uh, you have um, the Helena Independent putting out headlines saying your neighbor, your waiter, your maid, your, you know, cannot, could, might be a German spy. There's a worry that they're going to, like, bomb, you know, drop, you know, they're going to bomb Montana. Um, so, and, and there's a terrorism um, event that happens in New Jersey where the Germans do blow up uh, uh, an important site in New Jersey, and I'm forgetting what it was, but that was made big national news, so there was actually German terrorism on U.S. soil. So, the last question we were going to have you talk about, but we're not now, but I'm going to show you the slide to let you take it home and think about it some more, and we hope that all these things are going to, um, that you're going to keep talking about these things. Uh, is, this, is this quote, uh, uh, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And so our question is, in the context of World War I, uh, what do you think of that quote? And then again, in the context of today. Um, we want you to take these ideas and thoughts home. We want you to take the conversation home. We want you to take the... Um, opportunity to learn more home. Everyone got a bookmark when you came in. If you didn't, there's one on the table. It links you to the site. Most of the stories that we shared and many, many more are here on this story map. If you're interested in the home front, you can see uh, all of these home front stories here, plus a little bit of an overview um, that give you all sorts of um, different little snippets of life. Um, you know, the quilt campaign, or here's a, that's a mob, that's Lewistown book burning. Um, here's a guy who said that a bunch of his neighbors were getting married so they wouldn't have to go and, because uh, they weren't enlisting married men. They said they'd rather do their fighting at home. Uh, if you're interested in stories of service. Is that in reference to getting married? Yeah, it is. Yeah, absolutely. They went out and he said, yeah, all these guys, they, you know, they, they found out that only, they were only taking single men, so they quick got hitched. And they said, yeah, one of them said, yeah, I'd rather do my fighting at home. So uh, if you're interested in service numbers by county or some of the stories of service that Rich was sharing, if you want more of those, that's on the map. And if you want to look at the aftermath and the legacy of World War I in its state, our state, and how it played out, that's in that Home Again section. So we hope that you will... Uh, continue thinking about World War I over the course of the next year and a half, thinking about uh, the ways it does and does not parallel our current situation and what we can, can learn uh, by looking at the past. So thank you.